17, mainly we're going to look at. The last few weeks we've been looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, and it starts off with perilous times. <laughs> we live in, in troubled times, difficult times. And he, he talks about how there's, there's a tendency to, to not live by faith. You know, just to live uh, however we think is, is suitable. And uh, then Paul goes through in, in the latter half of chapter 3 there and, and just talks about living a, a real, transparent, godly life in, in spite of the difficulties and really in spite of the consequences. And remembering that any consequences here are just temporary. <laughs> you know, uh, whatever happens here, it, it's, it's only, only for time. It, it's not for e eternity, these physical things. But let's read starting in chapter 3, verse 10. Paul gives a, kind of a little bit of his testimony, really. Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I'll just stop reading there, there for the moment. Uh, God wants us to live godly lives. You know, no matter what's going on around us, uh, he wants us to live for him. He wants us to continue in the truth. They were going through persecutions at that time. And he said, it's going to get worse. <laughs> he said, anybody who lives for the Lord is going to face opposition. And really, what we believe is worth dying for. In chapter 1, verse 12, he says, the one who we believe is worth dying for. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And that, that's the theme tonight. So we look at these, uh, these verses, uh, continuing, you know, maintaining. I just, I just keep trusting my Lord, as we, we sang, as I, as I walk along. Uh, let, me, uh, let me point something out there in, in verse 15. I guess there's no little children here tonight, but uh, in verse 15 he says, That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know, we never outgrow our need for the Word of God. We used to have a book, uh, The Bible and Pictures for Little Eyes. <laughs> and, you know, it would take scriptures and just take a little bit and have a picture and you could explain it and so on. And, uh, we, we need the Bible when we're little, but we never outgrow that. Uh, it's something that hopefully can start when we're little. Not for, it doesn't for everyone. Uh, but he wants us to continue then. You know, for some, you'll start as a child of God. Uh, we had one man got saved when he was 80. <laughs> uh, he was a child of God. You know, he just a brand new baby Christian. First time I'd ever discipled somebody that, that old. <laughs> uh, boy, he had some interesting stories. He'd been in World War II and, you know, different things that he'd done. And a very interesting old fella. Um, I did his funeral a few years after that. And I was so pleased, you know, to be able to, to know him and, and look forward to uh, to seeing him in heaven. But you know, whether we're 2 or 20 or 120, uh, we need the Word of God. And that's what he's saying to Timothy. Now, Timothy had the blessing of having a Christian mother and a Christian grandmother. E evidently, we, from history, we think that his father and probably his grandfather weren't Christians. But his mother and his grandmother were. And they taught him the Word of God. Earlier on in, um, in the book, it well, just chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse um, 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. So he learned it as a child, and Paul is saying to him now, continue. Well, he's a pastor now. <laughs> you know, it's not like he's a little kid. Uh, but even as a, as a pastor, he needs to remember uh, what he's believed and who he's believed, and just continue uh, with that assurance. Uh, verse 16, he says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We never outgrow our need for the word of God and need to continue in it. And he says there in, in verse uh, 15, this is the Holy Scriptures. And we, don't, we don't often call it that. Usually we call it the Bible. Uh, what did I call it something the other day? And somebody said, what's that? <laughs> the scriptures, I think I might have used that, that word. That just means writings. Uh, Holy Scriptures, sacred writings. And that's what it is. It's, it's God's word. It's sacred writings. Uh, we should treat it like what it is. It's the word of God. Now, I remember as a kid, a, a pastor or an evangelist saying, you should never put any other book on top of the Bible. And, you know, different things physically. And that's good. I mean, I don't think you should mistreat your Bible physically. But listen, it's, it's not the paper and leather that's the important thing. There's nothing magic in this. You put it under your pillow, you'll just have a lumpy pillow, all right? It won't heal you. It won't give you great, it might give you bad thoughts because you, you might not sleep. I don't know. Uh, treat it with respect physically, but more important, treat what it says with respect. I've known people who, you know, they wanted to do certain things when the, like when the Bible was read. Some people think you should always stand up. And that, that's good. That's fine. Uh, I don't have people stand up because I feel like they read it better sitting down. I feel like they'll get more out of it if they remain seated and, and so on. But some people, out of respect, say, well, let's stand up, and that's fine. But listen, if you're going to stand up for the Word of God, then you need to read it and you need to obey it too. It's no good respecting it as a book and not respecting it for what it says. It is the Holy Scriptures, uh, and we need to believe it and obey it. Uh, James said, be doers of the Word and not hearers only. And don't forget the last part of that verse is James 1.22, deceiving your own selves. See, if all you're doing is hearing the word and not doing it, you're just deceiving yourself. And I think there's a lot of people like that. You'd be amazed how often people quote the Bible. If you're watching talk shows or, you know, just people talking in general, often people quote things from the Bible. A lot of times they don't know they're quoting the Bible. You know, they, they say they got, say, they got something happening by the skin of their teeth. That's a quote from the book of Job. Uh, or they'll, they'll talk about a house divided cannot stand. Or, you know, the, lots of phrases that we use come, come from Scripture. And, and sometimes people think that because they have a Bible, that they believe it. But they don't even know what it says. Uh, you know, you've got to open it up and, and get in there and honor it, uh, not just physically, but honor it uh, for what it said. God's, God's Word is real. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, I think this is a really good verse about this. He's talking to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now, that, that's a key for the scripture. For it to work, for it to work, you got to believe it. <laughs> it's not, it's not just a matter of reading it. You need to read it, understand it, and believe it, and act on it. Uh, and he says there, they didn't just take it as some man's word. They said this is, this is what God is saying. Ephesians six calls it the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And God uses it. Uh, it's the holy scriptures. And in verse fifteen of Second Timothy three, there he, he says that it basically that it leads to salvation. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, the holy scriptures. There's a verse we, we seem to come to it often from Psalm 19. Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. You ever notice that? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It's, it's God's word that leads us to salvation. Uh, Hebrews 4 says that the Bible is what will show us our heart. If you honestly and openly will read the Bible, it, it will show you your heart. Hebrews 4.12, he says, The word of God is quick and powerful. It means it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. 
That, that's a real interesting concept. See, as people, we're three part. We're body, soul, and spirit. Uh, your soul usually is considered your mind, will, and your emotions. And, and listen, it's not enough to accept God's word emotionally or intellectually. Some people have used the, the physical picture that some people miss heaven by that much. You know, they know it in their head, but they don't know it in their heart. Now, I know our heart is, anyway. Uh, but it, it pierces even to the dividing of soul and spirit. And, and if you'll honestly read God's word and let God speak to you, you'll go beyond just intellectual and emotional acceptance to having your, your spirit made alive in Christ. Trusting Jesus. And there's a difference, a big difference. He says it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word shows us our heart. Let, let me give you an illustration from Acts chapter 16. You've probably heard, if you've read the book of Acts, of a lady named Lydia. Acts 16, verse 14. It says, a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple. You don't hear that uh, profession very much anymore. Of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. And here's something we know about her spiritually. She worshipped God. Heard us. This is Paul talking. He's talking about Paul and, and Luke who wrote. Whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized. So here's a person who worshipped God, but wasn't saved. She, she wasn't a Christian. She, she just didn't know yet. And when she heard about Christ, the things... See, Paul always talks about Jesus. If you look at chapter 17, verse 2 there in Acts, it says, Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, out of the Holy Writings. He was, he was sharing with her the things of the Lord, and her heart the Lord opened. So here's a godly person, but she needed to be saved. She needed her heart opened. She wasn't a bad person. She wasn't a wicked person in the way we would think of it, but she, she needed to be saved. She needed to trust Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what we're talking about. It's like Jesus said to the disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. There's a lot of people who have a general belief in God. It's always interesting to think about how James said, the devil believes in God. <laughs> yeah, he believes and even trembles. Yeah, it's not believing in God. That's not enough. Now, here was a godly woman, but her heart needed to be opened. And that's what the Word of God does. It pierces between the, the soul and the spirit. He, he basically applied 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. This is the kind of verse, this is one of these important verses that if you don't have it memorized, you need, you need to at least know where it is. Now, I'll admit, sometimes I look at 1 and 2 Peter before I find it. But uh, I always know where it is in my Bible. So 1 Peter 1.23, he says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So he says we're born again. Our spirit is made alive within us by the word of God. That's how God sh shows us himself. That's how God shows us salvation. Uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. See, when God tells us to come to him in faith, he, just does, he doesn't mean just any faith. He doesn't mean just faith in faith. He means faith in him and what he said in his word. So Peter, uh, Paul applied what Peter wrote there in, in 1 Peter, uh, that we're born again by the word of God. Uh, Paul gave that lady the, the word of God, and Lydia's heart was open, and uh, she trusted Christ and, and followed him in, in believer's baptism. It's the Holy Scriptures. And it, it leads to salvation. So I mentioned earlier that um, you know, Timothy had this blessing right from a child. His mother and his grandmother were godly women and, and uh, taught him about the Lord. Uh, you know, this is th uh, faith through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And, and that's something even a child can understand. In fact, sometimes a child can understand it more easily. Because salvation is so simple as adults, we get cynical. We get it hardened. <laughs> we think, oh, it can't be that easy. Uh, Christ died for our sins. You know, the gospel is really, really very simple. We're the sinners. We deserve to go to hell. 
But God loves us and sent his son to die for us. He died for our sins. He was buried, and paid the penalty for our sins. He rose again to give us life. And he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, kids hear that and, and they say, can I do that? I, I, was, I was reading one uh, preacher, he, he was talking to some kids and, and he explained salvation. He said, how many would like to do it? And they all stood up. You know, the whole crowd, oh, <laughs> he didn't hardly know what to do. You know, a child can believe this. And even a child, I was going to say, uh, I wish our kids were here tonight. Even a child is responsible to know what God says. You know, just because someone's 8 or 10 or 12 or 15, it uh, doesn't mean uh, they're not responsible. You know, God's truth. Uh, they may not understand it all, but they can understand the, the simple plan of salvation. And the ones who should teach them, really, uh, like Timothy, uh, is, is the parents grandparents and so on. No, that doesn't always happen. Now, listen, one of the reasons I go out in the bus is because parents don't care. There's a lot of parents who don't care whether they're about their kids' souls. They don't know themselves. And, and so, you know, we do what we can uh, to try and, and at least get them to hear. Get them to hear. And maybe their little hearts will just be caught for the, for the Lord. Well, what a blessing, you know. And we, we hope for their parents as well. Uh, it's the Holy Scriptures. It leads to salvation. And then he says in uh, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That um, just means it's God-breathed. Now, I've heard, I've, I've experienced this one time, that if you can't breathe, you can't speak. Uh, one of the things you look for is if, if someone is, is unable to, to breathe is, you ask them a question, see if they can answer you. <laughs> if they can't breathe, they can't speak. I, I got the wind knocked out of me one time, and I couldn't, couldn't breathe. I couldn't say that I couldn't breathe. <laughs> it's, it's pretty scary. Well, God breathed. You know, what it's saying is these are the words of God. These come from him himself. God is able to communicate. <laughs> the God who made the universe is able to put words together in the right order and in the right way, and he's able to preserve them. You know, we don't have to worry about the Bible disappearing. God's looking after it, uh, and it's true and dependable. And let me say this. It's true and dependable whether you believe it or not. You know, you can, you can believe whatever you want. God won't make you believe it. But you need assurance of that. That's what he's talking about there in verse 14. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and it's been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. From a child you've known the, the Holy Scriptures. Uh, Timothy was assured of of God's word. He understood that it's God's word. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 talks about how it's, it's both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, he talks about how you know, God spoke through the prophets in uh, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, and then he says, and hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Old Testament, New Testament, uh, it's all God's word. Here's another verse I, I want you to, to know where it is. It's 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20. Whenever you're talking about the Bible, this is a verse that will come up. The other one was 1 Peter 1, 23. This is 2 Peter 1 and verse 20 where he says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, the confusing bit of that is, it, is at first look, it sounds like it's talking about how you understand the Bible. But that verse is talking not about how you uh, understand it, but how it was written. He's saying these, these writings weren't just somebody decided, oh, I'll write about this or I'll write about that. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a private message. It's not from a person. It's from God. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. That's what he's saying. It wasn't Isaiah who thought, oh, I think I might just write a book about God. No, he, it was a burning in his heart. He couldn't stop himself. Jeremiah, you know, Moses, Paul, all these different ones. It came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that's the assurance we have with God's word. This is not men's word about God. This is God's word to man. There's things in the Bible that those people didn't even understand. I said this to a guy the other day, and he poo-hooed me, but, uh, you know, there, there's things in the Bible that science didn't discover until centuries later. 
you know, the earth hanging on nothing, the sphere of the earth, and uh, you know, the, the way the weather works, and, and so on. There's lots of things like that. A prophecy, you know, things that were going to happen. It's pretty spooky when God writes about something you know, before it happens. Uh, and that's exactly, that you read about the crucifixion before it even took place in Isaiah and Psalms and, and so on. Uh, I don't want to get off on that, but uh, it, it's not a, a message from, from men. It's a message from God. It's not by the will of man. It's by the Holy Spirit. And through the scriptures, God reveals himself. I don't know if you've thought about it, but what we know about God, we know because God has told us. If you look at creation and so on, you, you, you know some general things about God. But you don't know specific things until God says, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is how I, I, I operate. God reveals himself. He reveals truth. He reveals eternity. Romans 3, 2 calls it the oracles of God. You know, oral hygiene, your, your mouth, <laughs> the oracles of God, God's words, God's uh, speech. Inspiration is not about the writers. You know, these weren't inspired writers. It's about the words. These are inspired words. <laughs> now, scripture is inspired. It's God breathed. Uh, so not only the, the, the authority of God's word, but also the, the sufficiency of God's word. God's word is sufficient. We don't need any more. There's no, nothing missing. Uh, there's nothing that we have to look for to, to find some hidden message. God speaks plainly. <laughs> you know, I know some people like to look for hidden messages in the Bible. Um, listen, if you're looking for one, you'll find it. <laughs> you'll work it out. But uh, the problem I have is not the hidden messages. It's the ones that smack me straight in the face, you know. It's the mirror of God's word, the reflections of myself that I see. And the Bible says that in verse 16 there that it's profitable. I guess we've, we've wandered away from 2 Timothy 3, but uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It works. It helps. It's profitable for doctrine. That's teaching. God uses words, and he teaches us. It's profitable for reproof. That's uh, rebuke to bring conviction of sin. You know, there's just times you'll, you'll read God's word, and you'll, you'll see, man, that's, that's not how I'm living. I have the testimonies of I can't remember if it's 50 or 100 different priests who became Christians. And, and almost without fail, each one's testimony is that they began to read the Bible. And as they read the Bible, they saw, that's not what our church teaches. That's not what I'm trusting. And they got saved. Um, of course, the Catholic Church accuses them that they only, they only did that because they wanted to get married. Because <laughs> they all do. Uh, but anyway... It's, it's there for reproof. It rebukes us uh, and brings conviction of, of sin. It's profitable for correction. This is the thing I love about God's word. God doesn't just rebuke us. He doesn't just show us where we're wrong. He helps us to be right. He corrects us. Uh, being set right. Restoration, you might call it. Uh, God gives us the way out. Uh, we're not hopeless. One of my favorite verses is Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all Joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. We have a God of hope. He gives us uh, rebuke, yes, but he also gives us correction. and he, It's also profitable for instruction in righteousness, training in righteousness. And what that does for us is there, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. He equips us for service. He makes us useful. Uh, that word perfect doesn't mean without fault. The illustration I often use is that my face is perfect. <laughs> it's complete. Now, it's not without fault, uh, but uh, it, it is complete. And you're complete in, in Christ. God brings us to perfection. He's sufficient. We sang the song tonight because I, uh, in picking out songs right before the service, uh, one of them I have written right here, Christ is all I need. He's sufficient. And when he says we're thoroughly furnished, it means we have everything we need. There's no, no other furniture we need to bring in. <laughs> uh, God makes us complete in him. God's word works. It works for salvation, to know about eternity. Uh, it works for teaching. Uh, Wednesdays, we're going through Proverbs. It just amazes me, all the things that are in there, that it deals with all these practical and um, just so many different areas of life. Uh, it, it, it works for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And,
like he warns us here, more than ever before, we need God's word. Uh, listen, the world talks a lot. Um, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But God's word is right. Times are not getting better, and we need uh, God's word to, to help us. There's a couple of verses in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 He says in verse Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now that, that's the subject tonight, you know, continuing, being faithful. And the reason we can do that is because he's faithful. We're not trusting ourselves; we're trusting him. And then he says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, as time goes on, and as things get worse, and as the, uh, the, the days, uh, like he talks about in, uh, in Timothy, waxing worse and worse, uh, we need to hold on to the Lord. We need to hold fast, and we need to hold together. Uh, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, uh, people that you wouldn't expect are are not always faithful anymore to their church. And uh, we need to be a part of a church. We're not the only church, but uh, you, you need to join up with, uh, with other believers and uh, hold fast and hold together. Uh, and he says there in Hebrews, and so much the more, even more now. You know, it, it's easy to go to church and be faithful when times are good and everybody's doing it. I guess there was a time in, in some countries, even in Australia, where it was more popular to go to church and then, and then it's easy, but as it gets worse, so much the more we need it. And when it becomes unpopular, that's when we really need to be faithful. Uh, we need to be, be serving the Lord so much the more. Uh, we need to get serious about knowing God. We need to be serious about knowing the truth and preparing for eternity. He talks here about how uh, the scriptures, the holy scriptures, uh, lead us to salvation. Have they led you to salvation? I hope so. I hope you're, you're trusting the Lord. We sang the song tonight, I just keep trusting my Lord. Well, it's got to start somewhere. Uh, trusting Jesus. Uh, let it lead you. Let God's word lead you to salvation. He says, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, trusting Jesus. We're going to take our song books and, and go to page 338. It's the song, Trusting Jesus. <laughs> 